<laughs> Obidai. I know why you want to do that today. Because Mrs. Hoffman would see you holding papers when you're singing. <laughs> she wouldn't mind. Okay, I've been going through a little survey of each uh, book in the Old Testament. So far, we're Obadiah. We'll try to get Obadiah and Jonah. Obadiah, page 1343, in case you can't find it. Okay, it's called The Vision of Obadiah. So he actually um, saw this. Experience, just like uh, John saw Revelation, and just like Micah saw his. So this is going to be a uh, quickie through here. Let's go and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand your words. I do pray that you'd help us to, this might arouse our curiosity to uh, study further each and every one of these books uh, of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Obadiah, as you can see, is uh, obviously the shortest book in the Old Testament. The 21 verses, no chapter per se, but it starts off the vision of Obadiah. Uh, it's not the same one that was with uh, Ahab and Elijah because they're several hundred years apart. Uh, nobody can really figure out who this guy is, this Obadiah, which doesn't matter anyway. And so uh, he has a vision, and the focus of the vision is uh, political, and it's in verse 1. Thus saith the Lord concerning Edom. Okay, so who's that? Okay, so this is about Edom, and Edom is a nation that stemmed from a man. And you go back to Genesis 36, verse 1, and you see who... Edom uh, originated from, Genesis 36. So this is a political statement. It's uh, the basis of the fight in the Middle East. Genesis 36, verse 1. Now, now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Now, that's pretty hard to interpret that, isn't it? I had to run to the Hebrew language in order to fully understand that. And I, I, you know, you say, what does it mean? Well, it, it means Esau, who is of Edom. <laughs> and so that's uh, many of the interpretations of the Bible are that simple if we just believe the words. Okay, so that's Edom. Uh, and in verse 6 of that same chapter, 36, you'll see that he uh, was like a Mormon or whatever, the fundamentalist Mormons, where he had several wives. But these were wives of Canaan. Okay, so there's somebody else that comes from Esau. He has a son. Look in verse 11 of chapter 36. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman. Does that name ring a bell? Okay, Eliphaz the Temanite. Remember, he's one of the three... Stooges that came to Job and accused Job of being the Antichrist. So Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, was that one of those three characters that um, were a friend of Job. And the time period, as far as I understand, is the same time period. Okay, Eliphaz the Temanite or the Edomites show up to a, be a continual uh, nuisance to Israel. Okay, and there's one in 1 Samuel 22. Remember there was a guy that uh, ratted out David when he was a fugitive. And then Saul told this guy to um, murder some priest. If you remember the guy's name, uh, he was a canine Doag the Edomite, okay, Doag the Edomite, and so he was, a, he was a guy that was in Saul's army, and he's the one that 
uh, was going to try to kill David, but God wouldn't allow it to happen. And so he murdered a bunch of priests in 1 Samuel 22. Uh, if you would, try Psalm 137. So the Edomites are the, are the descendants that the Muslims come from. The Muslims uh, come from Edom and Ishmael. Okay, so uh, Psalm 137, verse 7. And uh, it says, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. That's not a word that we would use, raise it. The idea is there is to destroy it. So the Edomites were... Not people who conquered a nation. Uh, there's no record of the Edomites ever conquering a nation in battle. Uh, but they would be your little snakes on the side that encouraged the ones to conquer them. And would be like the looters that come in uh, like after a hurricane or something. I mean, somebody just really scummy. Kicking somebody when they're down. It's like the scum that um, when you have a funeral... These scum that find out who has the funeral, and then they go to the family that's bereaving the person that died, and then they rob their house. And that's, that's becoming a common occurrence, and that's why you don't want to put your address in the newspaper in the obituaries, because then, or like in our case, they had somebody stay home at Ronnie's house to protect it, because these low-life scumbags will come in and, and uh, take things from you. That's like the Edomites. That's what the Edomites would, uh, did to the Jews. Uh, notice also what they did in verse 9 or 8. O daughter of Babylon, who art destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. So the Edomites were watching the Babylonians, uh, rejoicing in it, happy about it. And then look what the Babylonians did in verse 9. Happy shall he be that taketh and dashes thy little ones against a stone. So they were taking a killing the kids. And the Edomites reveled in that. So that's what Obadiah is writing about. He's writing about the Edomites. He describes them to be arrogant, conceited, and smug. Okay, you'll see that in verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. Okay, that right there in verse 3 uh, gives you a little bit of doctrine. Uh, clefts of the rock, does that sound familiar with the rock city? Okay, so o Obadiah is writing about, historically, about Babylon coming in and conquering Jerusalem, but doctrinally it's writing about uh, during the tribulation time period when the Antichrist and com company comes into the land of Israel and conquers and you know, just makes havoc, and the Muslims are ratting them out. Okay, here's one over there, and here's one over there. Okay, so uh, that dwells in the clefts of the rock. So that's Edom, that's modern-day Jordan. That's where the Jews are going to try to run and hide. Okay, and so the Edomites are arrogantly proud about that. And then it says, Whose habitation is high that saith to his heart, in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Well, God's going to do it. Though thou exalt thyself as an eagle, though thou set thy nest upon the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If these came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? Okay, and so forth and so on. So he's writing about the Edomites, and then verse 11, this is where they're ratting the Jews out, or will be ratting them out during the tribulation time period. Uh, verse 10, for thy violence... Against thy brother Jacob, okay, thy brother Jacob. So the Jacobites or the Jews, Esau, they're cousins. The Bible calls them brothers. And if you remember that, and then as you get to the back of the book, remember the back of the Bible is prophetic. And in the back of the Bible in 1 John, it talks about if your brother, you hate a brother, you're like a murderer to him. Doctrinally, that's the Edomites hating the Jews because that's a tribulation idea. 
Okay, still the idea is if you hate your brother, it's considered like a murder. But the doctrinal undercurrent of that is aiming at the Edomites of the tribulation time period. So then he says, uh, Thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest in the, on the other side. So you see, they're not actually in the battle, they're fighting. In the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, so the army and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Okay, thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in a crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Okay, so that's what they're doing. Okay, and uh, doctrinally, that's the aim of that. And uh, the Lord is laying it hot down hard on them because these people are taking advantage of somebody or the Jews in particular, and the Lord's putting it down hard on them. Okay, and uh, I've seen some guys uh, debate these Muslims, okay, and one way they really expose them is that they say, I want to hear you condemn publicly some terrorist act by a Muslim. Okay, and that's what really exposes them because they're not going to do that. They will not do that because they're afraid to condemn it because of the imams, but yet they're afraid not to condemn it because that's an abs- obvious exposure. And so I've seen some of these guys, you know, if you kind of watch them, how they debate them, and they'll put that on them, and that, you'll see that Muslim will hem-haw around, and, <laughs> and they don't want to come out and say it because... They don't want to condemn those acts. They'll claim they do, but they won't do it publicly. Okay, so that's Obadiah. Uh, Let's see. The doctrinal thrust is as usual uh, as far as the Old Testament prophets go. Second coming, we have the rock city in verse 3, which I mentioned, hindering the Jews in their plight to get to Petra. That's Isaiah 16. What is the motivation of the Muslims? What is their root sin? Okay, it's a satanic sin, and you find the root sin in Ezekiel 35, verse 11. Ezekiel 35, the entire chapter is about the Edomites, and it's about God laying it down hard on them, and he takes an oath in Ezekiel 35, 11, and there's nothing going to change this. He says, therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. Okay, that's that. That's their sin. They're envious of the Jews or Jacob because the covenant went from Abraham, Isaac to Jacob, and they're bitter against God. Okay, now the future for the Edomites, if you drop down Obadiah verse 15... Remember the main thrust is Jacob's trouble in the second coming. You see the day of the Lord, verse 15 and verse 17. God is going to allow the Jews to be like a flame or a fire. And the Edomites are the stubble. So they're going to torch them. Verse 17, Zion is going to be delivered. Verse 18, Jacob shall be a fire, house of Joseph, a flame, house of Esau for stubble. That's their future. They need some fire insurance. Okay, and um, that's the Edomites. Isaiah 34 is an entire chapter that writes about that. And in fact, Isaiah 34, God wants everybody in the world to know that. Ought to be a good track just to send it all over the place. O earth, hear the word of the Lord. All ye nations, hear the word of the Lord. (laughs) Saudi Arabia is going down. That's that area. God wants everybody to know that. Okay, and then there's something that dawned on me this morning. It's the first time this kind of, you know, hit me. If you would go to James 2, verse 25, see if this rings a bell with you. And I think it, it falls in line with this idea 
of the Edomites. James 2.25. Okay, the context is talking about faith and works. Uh, it's a tribulation passage, but it uses Rahab as an example. And it talks about the works that she did to demonstrate her faith. What was that work she did? I just read on that this morning. It's a Oh, yeah. The work she did was when she saved the Jews over Jericho. And she portrays a Gentile in the tribulation who exercises their faith by defending or helping a Jew or righteous in the tribulation. And that dawned on me this morning. I said, wow, I like that. And then that falls right in line with what's the judgment at the end of the tribulation? The judgment of the nations, and what are they judged for? They're judged in how they treat the Jews or the righteous during the tribulation. So here he's got that little truth just tucked away in that Bible. That book's an amazing book. Okay, so that's Obadiah. Now let's jump into Jonah. Okay, all you little ones, ready to answer this question? How many of you believe the Bible? Raise your hand. How many believe the Bible? How many believe that Jonah swallowed a whale? Okay, some of you still got your hands up. Good, good. <laughs> Jonah became the first submarine sandwich. Okay. Okay, Jonah and Revelation are probably two of the most maligned books in the Bible. And uh, Jonah, his, his, the name of him and his dad's name are, I can't figure out yet, really per se, I mean the meaning of them uh, or the purpose of them. Jonah, his name means dove. Okay, so that portrays the Holy Ghost. His dad, Amittai, means truth-telling. Of course, that's what the Holy Ghost portrays or does. But yet, in this book, Jonah, truth that he wants to be telling is the destruction of the Ninevites over the Israelites. And so that sort of kind of shows the preference of God. Is that he puts the Israelites above the Gentiles because they're a special favor with him back in the Old Testament. But he's a very unusual case. He had a... Uh, a great citywide campaign without all the advertisement pitches and everything. Now times when they try to get churches together, you can't get churches together anymore. The last one that got churches together was Billy Sunday. Billy Graham tried and started to, but during Billy Graham's uh, time, the churches starting, the, the new Bible started spreading this out so much that, man, you ain't getting together with anybody. Okay, but Billy Sunday was the last, but the... The way they had those large campaigns is they had a lot of advertisement going, a lot of work put into it. A lot of advertisement, a lot of work, a lot of prayer. Okay, Billy Graham was trying to follow up Billy Sunday, but when Billy Graham dropped the book, God dropped him pretty much, but he still get big crowds. Now Franklin Graham, his son, he just has a rock concert and then gives them some things and add Christ to your life, and that's good enough. Okay, so that's obviously a show. Now, Jonah had all of that without any sales pitch, without any advanced revelation, and he did not even report the converts to the sword of the Lord. Can you imagine that? He did not advertise it that it was the fastest growing revival in the country. They did not send them requests to come in to be a great evangelist that everybody can learn from his techniques. Uh, can you imagine him teaching a conference, a Baptist conference now? Okay, here's what you do. God tells you to go one way, you go the other way. You get swallowed by a whale. You die in the whale, and then you come up and stink to high heaven, and then you go into town looking like you're just death warmed over, and tell them in 40 days you're going to be destroyed. And then you go sit on the edge and hope that it happens. And that's Jonah's life. I mean, it's really a strange book. But uh, Jonah... Uh, like I said, it's, it's one of the most maligned stories in the Bible. 
as revelation, and it was so maligned that the Pharisees of Jesus' day did not even think it was supposed to be in the Bible. Okay, if you would look in John 7, verse 52. Okay, in, John, in the book of John, <coughs> Nicodemus is found three times. And uh, the first time he came secretly to the Lord at night. So you can see that he's quietly trying to consider the Lord. But he's a Pharisee. And then in John chapter 7, the Pharisees gotten together and they are plotting a conspiracy against the Lord. And Nicodemus is sitting there saying, I don't understand this. These guys are supposed to be Bible students. They're supposed to believe the Torah. And they are plotting against what the Torah tells us to do. And so he was going to try to, in his own way at that time, he's not come out totally for the Lord. Uh, and he's going to try to somehow rescue the Lord by throwing out a question. Okay, in verse 50, John 7, 50, Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Now, the answer to that is, obviously, we've got to give him a hearing. So he's trying to apply to their authority, but they don't answer the question. Okay, because they're intent on murdering Christ. They answered and said... Art thou also of Galilee? Well, that's not a real good answer. Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was. There was a prophet that came out of Galilee, and it was Jonah. Jonah was that prophet. But evidently, Back in those days, they maligned that story also. Okay, Jonah was from the tribe of Zebulon. You'll find that in Joshua 19, or I'm sorry, uh, 2 Kings 14, 25. Gath, Hefer, that's the town he came from. And in Joshua 19, when you put those two together, that's Zebulon, and that's Galilee, up out of Galilee. So here are these Bible scholars of the day either did not know that Jonah came from Galilee, or, more likely, they did not accept it to be part of the Old Testament scriptures. And that's probably more likely. And that's why many of the scholars, you know, try to attack the book of Jonah, because they don't want to accept it, because it's so unusual. It's unusual to them. It's not unusual to God. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ used the story of Jonah as an analogy for his death, burial, and resurrection. So that puts it on pretty heavy, heavy doctrine. The idea of rejecting or casting doubt upon Jonah's story, the story of Jonah and the whale, is casting doubt on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, and so it's kind of funny. Several years ago, and I've mentioned this before, but um, I had a guy who almost got down to Bible school. It was a fundamentalist school, same one I went to. Okay, but uh, I was teaching on Jonah. And I showed in Jonah chapter 2 where it says quite clearly that Jonah died. And it says, if we believe the words, that he went to hell. Jonah chapter 2. I mean, in verse uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, his soul went to the bottoms of the mountains, and uh, he, he, he cried out of hell. So I was teaching that, and this guy had been coming for about two months at the time, maybe three months, and he was starting to enjoy the Bible viewpoint, kind of getting enamored with it. But when I hit that idea, it threw him for a loop. How dare you teach me something I don't know? And I, and I was teaching away. It was down at Rensselaer Tuck, and, and I could see that that kind of hit up. Yeah, you know, and I, oh, boy, here we go. I can see it coming. 
And I just said off the cuff, I said, I don't care if you want to believe it or not. I'm just telling you what it says. And I can see they're talking and talking. And so, and then the gentleman raised his hand and he was going to try to give an illustration to refute what I just said. And he said, well, isn't it like the Lord's death and burial and resurrection? Thinking he's going to refute it. And gave a brief explanation. And I said, thank you so much for that, explana- that, uh, de- that illustration because that is exactly what happened. Jesus' body went in a sepulcher and his soul went to hell and Jonah's body was in the whale and his soul went to hell. Thank you for that analogy. He didn't really appreciate my uh, innocence on that thing. And so this is Sunday school and church and so... He and his family went into a Sunday school class and prayed and walked out and never came back. <laughs> now, I have a couple of thoughts about that. First off, you're going to leave a church because of that? Secondly, why don't you do a little research and read what it says? And if you can't agree with it, so what? I could care less. Okay, but that's, that's that mindset. Okay, and that's the thing that sometimes just kind of gets under a guy's you know, crawl, and you just got to deal with it and go on. Now, Jonah portrays several things if you look at the whole picture. One is he portrays the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Two, he portrays a believer who's mad at God. Did you ever get mad at God or upset with him? Why aren't you doing something? I, I, like I said, I've been going through Jeremiah. And when you get to chapter 12, Jeremiah says, um, Righteous art thou, O Lord, but... And he questions him about his judgments. Now, I like Habakkuk's methods. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2, where he said, basically, uh, Lord, I want to ask you some questions about your delay of justice. I'll wait until you reprove me. Because <laughs> no doubt you're right and I'm wrong. But isn't that us? Is that we, we, we tend to question God, why don't you execute justice quicker than I think you should? Where are you at on this? And that's what Jeremiah did. And that's what Jonah did. Jonah was mad at God because he did not wipe out the Ninevites. Jonah wanted God to wipe out the Ninevites. He was not afraid of him. A lot of times people portray that story that he ran because he was afraid. He was not afraid. He hated the Ninevites. And he wanted God to judge them because he could see the picture. God is raising up the Assyrians. The Israelites are thumbing their nose at God. God was going to use the Assyrians to spank the Jews. And Jonah didn't want that. He wanted God to spank them Assyrians. And then when he came in town and said, 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. And when day 41 came to fruition and they weren't destroyed, it portrayed him to be a false prophet. Okay, he probably could have put a PS on that. 40 days, you'll be destroyed unless you repent. Okay, and then in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, notice what God saw that he delayed his judgment. God saw their faith. He saw their works. Because that's Old Testament doctrine. And then God turned from his evil. He delayed that judgment a little over a hundred years. Okay, and so Jonah and Nahum are two books in the Old Testament that writes about uh, the Assyrians... And uh, uh, interesting, both of them end up with a question. That's how the book ends. Okay, so Jonah portrays death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He portrays a believer who's mad at God. He portrays a Jewish prophet who preaches the Gentiles during the tribulation. He portrays that because the Assyrians are Gentiles. He also portrays that when we reject light, the light of God, light becomes lightning. In chapter 1, he said to Jonah, he said, uh, verse 2, arise, go to Nineveh. 
He rejected that light. He had the experience with a whale. The next time God spoke to him, it was like an echo. Chapter 3, verse 2, arise, go to Nineveh. And this explains why sometimes in our lives, if God wants us to take a truth, or if he's putting his finger on something and we don't accept it, the next time he's going to talk to us about something, it's going to be the same thing. And if a person just throws that out of their life and say, leave church, and then maybe five, six years later, go to church, you know what God's going to point out to them? That idea, even if the preacher didn't even mention it. The Spirit is going to take those words and he's going to get that right back in their face. And this is why some people walk out and say, well, that's all that preacher preaches about. And he probably didn't even say it. Because God is the one, when we reject light of the Bible, that light, it becomes lightning. And Jonah portrays that. Okay, but it also portrays in chapter 4, verse 10... When Jonah got fussing with God, Jonah was honest. Okay, and God is patient with an honest man. Even though he was fussing with God. Chapter 4, verse 9. God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. He's so mad. Then said God, then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on a gourd, the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither made us it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than threescore thousand persons that cannot discern between their right and their left hand, and also much cattle? What's the cow's got to do with it? So 120,000 kids that don't know their right from their left hand. So what age is that? You know, I asked that down in Rensselaer a while back, and we had little Brady, little Brady, and uh, I thought he was about five or six. I said, what is that age? Don't you write from your left hand? And I said, hey, Brady, raise your right hand. He goes like this. <laughs> I said, okay, so it's probably six. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but notice how the Lord is patient with jo Jonah. He was patient with him. He was mad at God, but he was patient. Why? Because he was honest. He was honest about it. Okay, so that's Jonah. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop there. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to um, be faithful to your words. I pray that you'd help us to see the big picture of them, the whole overall viewpoint, but yet then also help us to delve into the forest and enjoy every tree and every leaf on the tree and study every little aspect of, of it, about it, that we might uh, love your word more. In Jesus' name, amen.